Happy 4th of July weekend to you. Hope you got some cookouts and did some fun stuff today. We moved into the part of the summer that is not my part of the year. You know, when it rains and it's more humid, when it finishes raining than when it started. Uh, so I'm going to suffer through it. And for those of you who like this part of the year, God bless you. I'm happy for you, and I can't wait to fall. Anyway, we're continuing our series on family values or core values this morning. And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been talking about these core values because it, it's our sense that uh, if, we're gonna ha- if we're going to achieve our mission of uh, helping people belong in community, believe in Christ, and become change agents in the world, there's some values that need to shape us as we do that. And so let me go over those four first four values again. Love. We unconditionally act up and out God's love by surrendering to him and serving those made in his image. Secondly, authenticity. We passionately pursue God-honoring lives of integrity and transparency for all the world to see. Discipleship, we unapologetically connect people to Jesus and others and Jesus' word, helping them to reflect his image. Core value number five, joy. We enthusiastically champion celebrating in community because the joy of the Lord is our faith. And core value number five today is generosity. We willingly empty our pockets by giving more and taking less and radical generosity. Let me read that again. We willingly empty our pockets by giving more and taking less and radical generosity. Have you ever been in a situation before that when you've been asked for something or you've been asked to help somebody with something and you didn't even have enough for yourself? Have you ever been in a situation where someone maybe has come to you and asked you for uh, uh, help with some financially, and, and you didn't have two pennies to rub together, as my grandmother would say? Have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been in a situation where someone has come to you and, and have, has made a request of you, and, and you were not in the position by way of your pocketbook or, way, or by way of your resources or by way of your, your emotional condition to, to meet that request? Have you ever been in a situation where even though you weren't, you weren't able to do it, you did it anyway? Well, this morning, I'm going to share a story of generosity from one of the most unusual places in the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 17. And, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to read the word and then we'll pray. And then this happened. Elijah the Tispite from among the settlers of Gilead confronted Ahab. Ahab is the king at the time. As surely as God lives, the God of Israel before whom I stand in obedient service, the next years are going to, the next years are going to see a total drought. Not a drop of rain or dew unless I say other words. Otherwise, God then told Elijah, get out of here and fast. Head east and hide in Kirith Ravine on the other side of the Jordan River. You can drink fresh water from the brook. I've ordered the ravens to feed you. Elijah obeyed God's orders. He went and camped in Kirith Canyon on the other side of the Jordan. And sure enough, ravens brought him his meals, both breakfast and supper, and he drank from the brook. I always think about what happened to lunch. Maybe lunch is a Western idea. Eventually, the brook dried up. Because of the drought, and God spoke to him, get up and go to Zareph in Sidon and live there. I've instructed a woman who lives there, a widow, to feed you. So he got up and went to Zareph, and he came to the entrance of the village. He met a woman, a widow, gathering friar wood. He asked her, please, would you bring me a little water in a jug? I need a drink. And she went to get it. He called out, and while you're at it, Would you bring me something to eat? And she said, I swear as surely as your God lives, I don't have so much as as a biscuit. I have a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a bottle. You found me scratching together just enough firewood to make a last meal for my son and me. After we eat it, we'll die. 
Elijah said to her, don't worry about a thing. There used to be a song like that. Go ahead and do what you said, but first make some, make some bis small biscuit for me and bring it back here. And then go ahead and, and make a meal for, from what's left over for you and your son. This is the word of the God of Israel. The jar of flour will not run out, and the bottle of oil will not become empty before God sends rain on the land and ends this drought. And she went right off and did, did as Elijah asked, and it turned out, as he said, daily food for her and her family. The jar of meal didn't run out, and the bottle of oil didn't become empty. God's promise fulfilled to the letter exactly as Elijah had delivered it. Would you pray with me for a second? Father God, we thank you for your word today. And Father, as we talk about this value of generosity, Father, we pray that you would, be, you would go ahead of us. Lord, that you would prepare our hearts. Lord, that you help us to understand this, this idea of generosity, not from a world standard, but from your standard, Father. Today, would you begin to change us from the inside out so that we can be the generous people that you created, the generous people that reflect your image because you are a generous God. And Father, we would hear from your word today. Lord, would you do away with all distractions, everything that we have in our mind that would distract us. And well, Lord, would you help us say, hear my Lord, speak. And then Lord, would you help us like the widow Z and like Elijah to be obedient to what you tell us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The generosity of the widow of Zareph to the prophet Elijah was a response to the initiative of God. The widow of Zareph, I call her widow Z, was generous, and her generosity was blessed by God. In this story, there are a couple of things that we can learn about this story. Number one is generosity is a response to God's initiative in our lives. Generosity is a response to God's initiative in our lives. God took the initiative in this scripture passage, and the people of God responded. Elijah responded when God said, hey, get out of there, and I want you to go to the other side of the Jordan, and the raven's going to feed you, and you're going to be able to drink from a brook. The widow Z responded when Elijah said, in spite of what she could see with her eyes, Elijah said, go ahead and make me bread first, and then there'll be some more for you. So God set up the situation for the widow, widow to be generous. God had taken care of Elijah, right? He took care of him until the brook dried up. God told Elijah to go to this place. And it's interesting, in Sidon, Zareph, Zareph was a place of Baal worship. And the ancient Canaanites and the Phoenicians relied upon the false god of Baal to provide rain for them. So you see what God does? God sends Elijah to a place where they don't even worship God or don't even acknowledge the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. He sends him there to be fed there. Have you ever had a situation in your life where God told you to do something that made no sense at all and, and you, just had to, you just had to obey and it didn't make Make sense and you couldn't see how God was going to work but he sent you there anyway because our ways are not his ways our thoughts are not his thoughts and sometimes God will send you to the strangest places to places that don't make any sense at all because it's not about you it's about him and he can work in the things that make no sense anybody been there Anybody dealt with that before? When God sent me, had, had me go for my foster parents that I absolutely loved, a very, a, a very stable home, a very Christian home, and he told me to go back to my biological parents that didn't make any sense at all. I couldn't wrap it around my head around it. I thought God was making a mistake, but God does not make mistakes. Because right up the hill, about 500 feet up the road, was a little church there that I got connected with that changed my whole entire life. Has God ever asked you to go to a place that didn't make any sense? This is what he's doing here. He sent Elijah 
to the capital of Baal worship to be cared for. And in the economy of God, a poor widow had been prepared to receive the prophet. God initiated the whole thing. Do you know that God's at work in your life? Before you even know he's at work, do you understand that God's grace goes before you in every situation that you're in? God's grace goes before you, and God was working in Widow Z's life before she even acknowledged God. God had been working in her life and getting her ready for this moment. God initiated the whole thing. What if the widow would have hoarded her resources? What if she would have kept and hoarded the little that she had left? She could have said, what's mine is mine and I'll keep it. But instead she said, what's mine is yours and I'll give it. We live in such a culture of hoarding. Have you seen the show Hoard? Has anybody seen the show? It's an interesting show. It's a very interesting show. Now, I know some of them have issues like dealing with loss and abuse and et cetera, but some of them just can't let go. True confessions here, I can be a little bit of a hoarder. You know, Rose is trying to get rid of some stuff and move some stuff out of the house. And, and, and it, it's, I, I have boxes that we moved uh, to Virginia from New England 20-something years ago, 20, 22 years ago. And I have some boxes that have never been unpacked. <laughs> and, and Rose would like to get rid of some of those boxes, but there might be something in those boxes that I could use, even though I haven't opened them in 20-something years. I can be a little bit of a hoarder. I think the Fredericksburg area is a hoarder. Have you seen all of the, have you seen all of the, the, those kind of places where you store stuff, those storage places? They're building them. They're, I, I can't imagine that we need another storage unit place, but, but, but over, by the, over by on the other side of 95, Right there where that Bob Evans used to be, they're building another one. That's got to be like 20-something just, just in the Route 3 corridor. Do you think we're hoarders here? I know some of that's because we have people in the military that store their stuff for a little while because they're going to another spot. But I, got, I guess the majority of that is people who can't get rid of stuff. They even have a show now where they sell the units that people have forgotten about. And you can buy the unit and see if there's any trash in the tra treasure in the trash. What if, what if she would have hoarded? Now, the Mayo Clinic says that if you have any of these symptoms, you just may be a hoarder, okay? Okay, so think about this. Don't, don't, don't you elbow your spouse. Don't do it. Ongoing difficulty, throwing out or parting with things regardless of their actual value. Anybody got that going on? I went to Vermont, and we found this nice uh, etching in a frame. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to, here's another true confession. I watch, uh, I watch that show where they, they kind of do the appraisals of the old stuff. Um, I, I watch that show on PBS. So uh, I, I got this frame, and I, and I just think it's worth something. And Rose says it's, it's not worth anything. And I just think it's worth something, so I've kept it. And this is way beyond 20 years. This is going on like 30 years ago, and I still have it there because one day I'm going to go to the Antique Road Show, and someone's going to tell me it's worth some money. <laughs> Number two, feeling the need to save items and being upset by the thought of getting rid of them. Number three, building up clutter to the point where you can't use your rooms. I'm not that bad yet. Trying to be perfect and avoiding the delaying of decisions. If you have any of that, you just might be a hoarder. What are you hoarding? Now, many times we hoard material possessions, but we can also hoard immaterial things like love, like forgiveness, like emotional support. Are you a hoarder? Are you hoarding your, your time, your talents, your treasures, your toys? What if Widow Z would have hoarded her stuff? What if she was like some of us and said, I can't help you, or God bless a child that has his own? What if she was wasteful? See, occasions for generosity are more than just opportunities. They are a setup by God, orchestrated for us to be generous. Can you identify events in your life that have caused 
have called you to be generous? Is, call, is God calling you right now to be generous with your time or maybe with your talent or your finances? Is God telling you to be generous with your forgiveness? Can you identify events in your life where you're called to be generous? If God has blessed you with abundance, and folks, let me just give you, 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 you might be in bad shape here, but compared to the rest of the world, we live in abundance. If God has blessed you with abundance, I believe he's also called you to a life of generosity. And you can't measure your generosity against anyone else's generosity. Generosity is about what God tells you to do because God is a generous God. Perhaps God is calling you to be generous and forgiving someone you feel who has done you wrong. It could be that God is setting up an opportunity for you to be generous with your time or even your acceptance of another person who doesn't fit into your box of what a person should be. When God sets the events in order in your life, he moves upon the heart to respond to his initiative. That's why we willingly empty our pockets by giving more and taking less in radical generosity. So generosity is a response to God's initiative. Whenever God gives you an opportunity, he's working something out. He's doing something. Your opportunity to be generous, when he calls you to be generous, he's going to use it in some way. So generosity is a response to God's initiative. I believe the second thing that we can understand is generosity is a matter of the heart before it's a matter of the hand. Generosity is a matter of the heart. It's a heart issue way before it makes it to the hand. Let me say something to you. If you're, if you're not generous in the heart, you're not going to be generous in the hand. You might be in a reciprocal situation and you give this because you're going to get that or you help that you're going to get something has changed, or maybe you brought into the prosperity gospel that says, if I give this, God's going to give me triple and double and quadruple. But generosity begins in the heart. It's an attitude of the heart before it's an act of the mind or the hand. Giving from the heart is not a virtue or a religious practice. It's a way of life. Because once God has moved into the scene and, and given you a generous heart, it's just what you do. You can't help it. It flows out of you. Generosity is an attitude that has to be first cultivated within the heart before it can be fashioned into a plan and developed in the mind or a labor done with your hands. The poor widow Z who God commanded to supply the prophet Elijah with food, was lacking in resources. But God had prepared her. When the prophet asked her for food, when he asked her for a small amount of food, a last meal's worth, when he asked her for that, that's all she had left. But, but yet because God had, God had begun to work on her, his grace had gone before her, he was preparing her for this ask. And even though she had very little, she was willing to share with what she had. Like the little boy with the fish and loaves, she gave them to God, Elisha's, prof, Elisha's prophet, with, with a labor of faith that she had, had, had first been cultivated in her life. Just think about it. Here comes the, this guy, this, this prophet, not, not one of your prophets, not one of the prophets of Baal who she served, but, but this prophet of these people, these people in Israel, this prophet comes and he asks you for your, your last meal. And somehow, because God has been doing something in your heart that you don't even know about, you offer your last meal to the prophet. She went to the extreme and she gave generously out of her poverty. I'm reminded of Jesus and his disciples watching people march up to the offering plate and, and, and give their, their, out of their, out of their uh, kind of wealth. And so they were giving all of this money, and the disciples were wowed by all the money these people were giving. But then this widow came up, and she put in a mite, kind of a half of a penny, 
And, and, and Jesus wasn't wild about all these people giving out of their, out of their plenty. He was wowed by this woman. And the uh, and disciples didn't understand it. And, and, and Jesus said, they gave out of their wealth. But this woman, this woman gave out her poverty and she gave everything she had. She could only do that because she responded out of a heart that God had prepared. Let me ask you a, self, let me ask you a question. Are you allowing God to prepare your heart? Are you allowing God to change you from the inside out so that you become a person of generosity? In our tradition, we believe that God goes before, that God is at work in your life before you even know it. So God had been at work in her life. Her act of generosity wasn't because she possessed wealth, or because she possessed little. She was generous because she responded with her heart. Generosity has more to do with the heart than it does to do with the mind or the hand. We will never have enough to be generous with if we don't start with an attitude cultivated in the heart. You know, there are people who have way more than they need they have more than they need and their, their, their kids need and their grandkids need and their kids from generations from now would need. But unless uh, the, this generosity has been cultivated in their heart, they, they're just not generous people. Sometimes we need to pray, Lord, would you change my heart so that my spirit is more like you? Because when we're generous, we're most like God when we're generous. We're most like God when we're generous. Let me say that again. We are most like God when we're generous because God is a generous God. God is a God who loved us so much that he gave. And he didn't just give a little something. He's, he's a God who bankrupt heaven. We talk about the great kenosis passages where, where Jesus leaves all the splendor of heaven and, and, and he incarnates, he puts on flesh and bone, and, and he lives among us. He's a generous God. And so when we're generous, when we're generous, we're most like God. God could have been a hoarder. He could have said, you know what? They're getting what they deserve. By the way, that's what grace is. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, heaven, instead of getting what you do, what you and I do deserve, hell. He's the generous God that makes it possible for us to live with him eternally. He's a generous God. Generosity starts in our heart before it becomes an act of our hand. That's key truth number two. Generosity enables God to teach us. Generosity enables God to teach us. When we're generous, God is teaching us. God can teach us through generosity. God is the ultimate provider. We should never try to measure God's ability to provide, and we should always look to the Lord through the eyes of faith. A Chinese proverb says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Let's take this first step toward living a life of generosity. You say, well, well, James, the pastors are always talking about generosity because they're always trying to get in my pockets. This is not an attempt to get in your pockets. This is an attempt to have you understand that generosity is more than just about your pocket. Generosity starts in the heart. And when God begins to change our hearts and, and cultivate generosity in our hearts, then we're generous with everything that we have, material things and immaterial things. Everything we have, we become generous with. We become generous with it. That's what the widow did in our scripture. When the widow gave generously, God provided for her miraculously. God activated a constant supply of oil and flour 
Let's read verses 14 and 16 again. This is the word of God to Israel. The flour will not run out, and the bottle of oil will not become empty, because God sends rain on the land, until God sends rain on the land and ends this drought. And she went right off. I love that. And she went right off. Now, this was a woman that was going right off to make the last meal and give it away, and she went right off. You know something in the Bible talks about when people obey God, they go right off? It's interesting. She went right off. I love that. And did as Elijah asked, and it turned out, as he said, daily Food for her and her family. The jar of milk did not run out. The bottle of oil did not become empty. God's promise fulfilled to the letter exactly as Elijah had delivered it. I wonder what would happen if we would become a generous people. And as God prompts us, as God changes our heart and begins to prompt us, if we would go right off. And when he says, you know what, this person doesn't deserve forgiveness, but I want you to forgive them anyway because I was generous. And when you needed forgiveness, when you were lost without hope, I came down, I died, I forgave you. Generosity. Generosity. Maybe God is saying to you today, you know, here's a situation that I've put in your lap. This person needs someone to connect with. And I know you're busy, but you need to take time up and you, and you need to connect with this person. You need to be generous with your time. Because I'm the God that's everywhere and know everything and all powerful. And when you pray to me, I attune my ears to you in generosity. See, when we're generous, we're most like God. And, and we're generous at God's initiative. God initiates, and then he changes our heart, and then he begins to teach us some lessons. What if she had been stingy? What if she had, had ignored the move of God in, of her heart? By, by God, what if she would have eaten her last meal? What if she would have said, listen, I, I wish I could give something to you, but this is my last meal. You know what would happen? She would have let, ate her last meal, and she would have died, and we would have never heard from her again. But because of the God's initiative and because God began to change your heart, God taught her the lesson that God who makes a promise will keep his promises. And the Bible says it happened just as Elijah said. What is God? What's the promise of God that's before you this morning? That, that as you are generous, you, you activate that promise. The flower did not run out. The oil did not run out. Because she believed God's prophet, she kept on eating until the rain returned. Someone here today needs to hear, needs to hear uh, uh, and understand that God initiates. Someone here today needs to understand that God will change our heart, that generosity is not just our natural inclination. It's because God gets a hold of our heart and he begins to change us from the inside out. And then we become like him, generous. Someone today needs to get out of what you can figure out needs to get out what's in your bank account, needs to get out how much emotional uh, energy you think you have and just surrender to God in such a way that God can redouble your bank account, that God can redouble your energy. At my last church, we were going through a really tough time. And uh, we, uh, we went through a tough time. 2008 came and uh, all the... The Great Recession came, and we had a ton of people move out of the area. And I had to lay off some people, and, and it still wasn't enough. And it came to this place where I had to make a decision. And uh, I decided to cut my salary significantly and give it back to the church. 
And, and it was one of those things where God said, I'll take care of you, and I decided to take him up on it. An interesting thing, and I wouldn't suggest this to everybody. God has to tell you it. But the interesting thing is Rose and I never missed the money. We never missed the money. God began to provide and provide and over-provide. He began to help us to live on what we had. And he began to provide in such a way that, that even after cutting our salary, we could still give to whatever he called us to give to because he began to provide for us. That's because God had changed our heart. He had cultivated this generosity. It wasn't something that Rose and I could put together because when we did the math, it didn't add up. <laughs> it didn't add up. But that was in our economy. But in God's economy, things are different. And there was much more that God did. When the widow's son became critically ill, God used Elijah to revive him. Here's the second part of the story. Later on, the woman's son became sick. The sickness took a turn for the worse, and then he stopped breathing. The woman said to Elijah, why did you ever show up in the first place, a holy man barging in, exposing my sins, and killing my son? Elijah said, hand me your son. He then took him from her bosom, carried him up, to the loft where he was staying and laid him on his bed. And then he prayed, oh God, my God, why have you brought this terrible thing on this widow who has opened her home to me? Why have you killed her son? Three times he stretched himself out full length on the boy, praying with all his might, God, my God, put breath back into this boy's body. And God listened to Elijah prayer and put breath back into his body and he was alive and Elijah picked the boy up carried him downstairs from the loft and gave him to his mother here's your son said Elijah alive and the woman said to Elijah I see now it, it I see it all now you are a holy man and when God speaks God speaks a true word because not only did he he that God her her generosity took care of Elijah and her until the until the drought was over her her generosity gave her a provision where her son was raised from the dead because God did way more than she could expect. Her generosity was way more than she ever thought she would receive. If she would have taken her dough and taken her oil and eaten her last meal, they would have died then. But even when she was generous, because sometimes things don't turn out the way we think they're going to turn out. But God is still in charge. God is still on the throne. Remember that God is teaching us that he is our provider. Did you hear me there? God is teaching us that he is our provider. And when God calls us to be generous with our resources, our time, our abilities, he does so so that, he, so that we know that he is the person that provides. Let me say to you, your generosity will bless others, and it will bless you. And not, not in the health, wealth, and prosperity way, but because God will be teaching you, and God will be making you more like him. I don't know about you, but my prayer is, God, make me like Jesus. That's my prayer. And you're more like Jesus when you're generous than any other time. In my own life, I found that the more I give to others, the more that I have. The widow Z's response to God and generosity taught her that, number one, that the God of Israel exists. She was, she was serving gods made of clay. She was serving gods made of wood, Ezra poles and, and Baal. She was serving gods that were not living. She was serving inanimate objects. But she found out through this story, through her generosity, which was a response to God initiative, which was a response to God cultivating something in her heart, that God exists. Secondly, she learned that God can be trusted. 
She, it, it kept on happening. It happened just the way God said. It happened just the way Elijah said. She learned that God could be trusted. And third, she learned that God will provide. I've been asked so many times, why does Sell and Fill Church give so much money away? And, and, and I will usually respond, I can't take credit for that. I, I, I can take credit for continuing it, but it started with the founding pastors, Buddy and Gay Marston. And we've just kind of kept that tradition alive. We've just kind of kept it alive because, because Buddy taught me something a long time ago. You can't outgive God. And, and we, just, we just keep on giving. We want to be a generous church. But, we can, but, but here's how this works. God begins to set initiative. He begins to cultivate and change our hearts. And then as we're generous, then the church is generous, and we keep on giving it away, and we most represent Jesus when we're a church and a community that continues to be generous. We believe that willing just that, that willing generosity frees us from a culture of greed. It places our dependence on God, and it blesses the world all around us. We can't take the stuff of this world with us when we die, but we can invest in the work of the kingdom through four spotsy, through summer serve, through our global engagement initiatives. We can invest in it, and then God can begin to change lives, and there are people who will march into eternity because you were generous. And here's the deal, you're here today and I'm here today because some people uh, uh, responded to the initiative of God and God began to change their heart and they were generous and they built churches and they sent missionaries and they prayed and they spent time and they invested in you and you're here today because of that. You're here today maybe because Billy Graham, somebody invested in him and he invested in someone else and he had a crusade. We're here today because of generosity of God through his people. And we're called to be generous. It was John Wesley said, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times that you can, to all the people you can, as long as you can. So we willingly empty our pockets by giving more and taking less in radical generosity. It's my prayer that we will be the most generous people in Spotsylvania County in the greater Fredericksburg area. And then people would say, they're like Jesus. Pray with me. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this little story found in, <laughs> in First Kings of the widow Z and her generosity. Lord, would you, would you help us to, to step into your initiative? Would you help us to allow you to cultivate life, a heart change in us so it moves from our heart to our hand? And Father, would you help us learn the lessons, would you teach us through generosity to be like your son? So Father, today maybe there's some people here who don't know you as Lord and Savior, and they, they long to know you. The good news is today can be their day of salvation. Today can be the day where they know you, for you so loved the world that you gave <laughs> You were generous that whosoever, and if you're here today and you don't have a relationship, put your name in that place. Whatever your name is, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Father. And then, Father, for those of us who've been on the road for a while, us belongers and believers and people becoming, would you help us? Would you change our hearts and, Lord, as we walk into summer serve, as we walk in to kind of what we're doing in this summer and even in the fall, would you help us to respond in generosity of our time, of our talents, of our treasures, of our toys. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, we're going to respond today. We have communion here and here. And then we also have, if you want to be anointed, you can be anointed there. You can nail something to the cross, bow at the altar. Maybe today you would say, James... I've just not been generous. I've been hoarding. 
have not allowed God to change my heart. Today, God will do that. He'll be happy to do that because he's, he's more than excited to transform you into the image of his son, Jesus. God bless you. Love you guys. Let's stand together and let's respond together.